All right, well, we're live. Welcome to Breath to Breath. This is our third guest, and I'm very excited to introduce him because I actually know him personally. <laughs> personally. <laughs> I've taken his classes. I've been to some of his offerings, and um, it's just a really great human overall, but got the logistics. So let's introduce Dr. Philip Wilder is an associate professor in literacy, literacy, language, and culture at Clemson University, where he researches how youth rewrite their sense of self and develop compassion for self and others. When not facilitating study groups on nonviolent communication, <laughs> he <Great> organizing, <laughs> oh, here, drum roll, organizing Wangaza education for partnership in Tanzania. Philip can be found backpacking, writing or teaching mindful flow and meditation yoga classes. His classes promote yoga as a breathing yeah. practice, creating greater equanimity, personal power, and peace off the mat. Welcome, Philip. Thank you so much. It's yes. great to have a conversation. I'm uh, so glad that we can chat. I know. I um I definitely remember when I first heard of you or came to one of your classes. I was like, oh, he's doing things that are different. He is taking a different approach to not just yoga. So my background in yoga was the power flow, the hot yoga. So when I came to Indigo, which is where you teach, and then really started um, kind of learning more about what you were offering, I just knew, I knew I wanted to like, get to know you better and get to know what you were doing. So with that, thank you for, thank you for coming on to this. Oh, this you're platform. quite welcome. Yeah. And then to just shout out, uh, as soon as we got on, I know exactly where Philip is. He's at this wonderful <laughs> coffee shop called Methodical <laughs> Coffee. And can you please share with everyone what is your usual because you are consistent, if anything? Oh, I mean, I this is maybe two blocks from where I live. And uh, I'm just the type of person that needs a little bit of activity around me to be productive, a little bit of noise. Yeah. So I, I can I can walk in here at Methodical and, and they have my my green tea ready for me. I'm, yeah. I'm that um, consistent with coming here. Um, but it's a it's a wonderful space and, yeah. and good people. Absolutely. Well, and I know you literally just came back from Tanzania. So can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing there, your experience, and sure. maybe how some breathing came into play? Yeah, yeah. So I was I just returned from Tanzania a few days ago, um, and I'd been there uh, for three months. And um, my title or my role is senior education advisor to One Gaza Education for Partnership. And when Gaza has existed for about 25 years in Tanzania, uh, which for those of you that are not familiar, it's a country that's just south of Kenya, uh, borders uh, Uganda as well. Um, and so basically, Mwangaza runs um, three core programs in secondary schools and communities throughout the country. And our mission is to um, improve teaching and learning for students, uh, for adults, for parents, for everyone but uh, our main focus is in secondary schools. And so we think that if we wanna improve the way that students learn in secondary schools there, uh, that we need to improve the way the teaching occurs. Um, and so one program focuses on teacher education, um, but we also recognize that the, the challenges that students face in their own lives accompany them in the, in the classroom and in the school. Um, so the degree to which uh, they are feeling vulnerable and unsafe outside of school, um, that needs to be addressed as well. So we have a second program called Safe Schools. And so we're really helping to educate teachers and headmasters and all of the adults um, on, on what is emotional safety for students? What does it mean to create physical safety for them? Um, and so that is the second program is, is that Safe Schools. And, and it has uh, teacher education like seminars, but it then also has peace clubs. We have yeah. peace clubs for youth and they can come together once or twice a month. And then the third program that Mangaza runs is Safe Families, because we think that uh, ultimately we want to be um, advocates and partners uh, for change within families, within communities. And so that program addresses gender-based violence, conflict resolution, um, growth mindset, um, emotional awareness, and so through all three of those programs, come back to your question, you know, the breath, um, our presence, 
um, is key to all three of those. And so we use nonviolent communication in all three programs and uh, as a way for everyone, uh, participants, us at Gaza, um, me, to really be grounded in our own presence. And for me and for us, that means our breath. Um, the degree to which I have equanimity, the degree to which I have emotional awareness, the degree to which I see conflict as an op- opportunity to have mine and other people's needs met, um, that is essential to any sort of educational work that we do with others. That was a very long answer, uh, mm-hmm. but my role there is is to advise the management team. Um, it's a Tanzanian-run organization, and I just advise them on improving programs, mm-hmm. finding grants, finding funding, and communicating the, the stories um, of the impact of what we do. Yeah. Well, uh, clearly you've been busy and clearly this didn't just happen overnight because like everything that you just wrote down and like the things that I especially was like, oh, emotional safety, safe schools and safe families. Like, I just know that when you do not feel safe, there's no way you can learn. There's no way that you can grow. You're constantly stuck in fight or flight. So I think that's, that's right. I mean, that's so impactful and amazing that that is the goal is like to get you not only just survival, but thriving. Um, yeah. and, and what I think is so cool too is it's how did, how did that even happen? Like how, how did you end up in Tanzania? <laughs> and granted partially this interview is so I can learn more about you. So sure. Hold, actually hold on to the Tanzania thought. How did you get started? How'd you get started in yoga? How'd you get started in breath mm. work? And the question that I've been asking is your, Basically, not your family of origin, but your breath of origin. What is what is the start of Philip's breathwork journey, breathing practice? Yeah. How did this start to weave itself into your life, into something of of impact? Yeah, I, you know, I was forty years old before I ever went to a yoga class, before I ever meditated. Um, I was oblivious to where my breath was, mm-hmm. um, let alone what it was what it was telling me, prior to turning forty. And uh, I just turned 49. So the last nine years has really been a, um, uh, a path for me of yeah. really using my breath as an indicator of what is going on in my internal waters. Um, so I had moved to South Carolina in 2013 uh, to start my job at Clemson. I was going through a divorce and uh, really kind of an uprooting of, of the life that I had had um, when I lived in Illinois. I lived there 30 years. And so when I moved here, I, I left family, I left uh, marriage, I left my home, I left my job, I left my friends, I left that sort of identity. And when I moved here, um, a good friend of mine um, brought me to a yoga class at Greenville Yoga, and I met Brian Delaney. And uh, if anyone's ever been to any of Brian's classes or Liz's classes or anyone in that studio, um, he's always talking about finding your breath. And I remember those first classes where I'm like, what does he mean? <laughs> Find your breath. Um, I was just oblivious. I was unaware of, uh, of my breathing at all. And so um, I started through those classes and through the meditations that I would go to um, and through the girlfriend that I was dating at the time. She was a, a wonderful influence on me of really seeing my breath as, as trying to communicate. Um, so the longer my breath is, the more aware I am of my breath, um, the the more that I can get out of my mind, um, the more that I can kind of give my mind a break. And and um, and I realize that our minds are important, but they also uh, carry stories about who we are. They are, our ego mind is always trying to make us feel safe. Uh, look out for this. What did she mean by that? Oh my gosh, did he just blow me off? But, do I need to respond to this email right now? So for me, coming back to my breath, learning to come back to my breath has been essential to any sort of peace and thriving uh, that I've had in life, as well as just the way that I relate to myself and others. Yeah. Well, I I love how you kind of wove that in together. And, and what I was going to say um, is I think we absolutely we absolutely find people and attract the people that we need at the time when we need them. And it sounds like you, you peeled away some layers that were no longer serving you. And then when you came into this space of South Carolina, 
through creating space with your breath and the length of your breath, then you're able to allow new things to actually come in and basically rebuild. That was like you did a lot of rebuilding of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think we all have different stages in our life where we have different iterations of us that we oh, no longer so, need. So many. Right? <laughs> so, and, and so then we many. kind of step into, step into more authenticity. And so know. this has been a path for me of doing that. And breath has been really important. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, um, my breath is an indication of my emotional waters. It's an indication of um, what is going on in my body, what I'm allowing to flow, what I'm uh, suppressing, pushing away. It's an indication of how active my mind is. Yeah. Um, how much is my mind busy trying to keep me safe or trying to honor or trying to meet needs that I have that I may or may not be aware of? Yeah. Um, so it's, to me, it's it's just a, it's just the indication it is. Of, and, and of my overall health. I mean, and if you can't tell I'm writing lots of notes, but what I love that you said is the breath is an indicator of the internal waters. And then you revise it same with my emotional waters. And honestly, that's what I love that you do also like breath work and the meditation. Cause that's what I focus on as well. Understanding that the breath is the bottom up the meditation is the top down and depending on what's going on here that will affect this what's going on here will affect this and it's just this ongoing loop so what you get to do with yeah. the breath work and the meditation is create a disruptor to actually stop and sit with mm. it and understand is this even what i want is that what what i want to invite or is this something i can just let go and move through me and i love the waters analogy that's a spot on yeah, that's, I really, I really value how you just explained that. I, um, it is that cyclical process, of, um, you know, whether it's in a yoga class yeah. or my own practice or yeah. my own meditation or my meditation classes that I teach. Um, I just, I always, uh, I value coming back and starting with the breath. Mm -hmm. Where is your breath? And um, can I lengthen it? And can I um, sync breath and movement? Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed is that the more, like a lot of people, the more that I focus on my breath, lengthening, listening to it, paying attention to what is my breath telling me about my body and my mind and my spirit and my emotions, the more my mind has an opportunity to rest. Yeah. Um, because we, we overwork our minds. <laughs> um understatement of the year we they're, they're tired yeah, yeah they're tired they yeah well i was gonna say what what i think is really cool is uh even though we both teach yoga we both teach meditation you came to this place from the educational background and um uh, from as being an educator and i came to it from more medical background and and we're saying the same thing, but we're just using different verbiage, different um, different language, but the message is the same. And and what I keep coming back to is like, this is a closed system. Like, it's not like my head's disconnected from my body right. or my body's disconnected from my head. Like we've got this thing called the vagus nerve that fully <laughs> connects us all together. Like it's not going anywhere. One thing always affects the other. And actually I just have the visual, I can remember a I used to live in Texas, moving back home from Texas to South Carolina, renting a U-Haul. And they mm. didn't, my dad didn't really let me drive the car with the U-Haul, but there was one time that I had to like back it up and I just messed it all up because I couldn't get the connection right. And it just reminds me of if you think just the breath or just meditation, you're going to have a U-Haul that's not going in the right way because oh, yeah. they're intimately, intimately connected. So, Yeah. It's hard to get, it's hard to straighten that out. You know, any of us that have ever had a trailer that we're trying to back up and it, uh, and it gets bent at a 45 degree angle. Uh -huh. And we're like, I just want to get out of this vehicle and not even drive it anymore. Yeah. Well, I guess that would be um, avoidance or neglect mm. or just uh, numbing. I'm just going to pretend like this isn't here. Um, uh, all right, well, getting into some of the things that you like to teach, let's talk a little bit about nonviolent communication, because this is sure. one of the other ways I've gotten to know you. And I know this is something that you are highly educated, like 
high, highly educational, highly educated about and educating others as well as what you're doing in Tanzania. But I've been to a couple of your um, your study clubs and you, can I say you do a hell of a job, you do a hell of a job, but I would Thank like, you. it's my, it's my interview. I can say whatever I want. You can, you can, can. you can say whatever you want. Um, so how about you say whatever you want about like, what does this mean to you? How has this impacted you? And what, what is it that you keep coming back to over and over again? Sure. Yeah. And so I would, I would start by just saying that I continue to learn uh, with others about how to be more conscious and compassionate with my communication, my communication with other people, but ultimately my communication with myself. And so anyone that knows that framework by Marshall Rosenberg, he talks about how uh, we can offer empathy to others um, and we can speak our truth. But really it's about like, what am I needing? What are they needing? How can we get our needs met? So I want to use a story to talk about why this framework is important to me and, and how it continues to challenge me. Um, this summer, back in June, I was, uh, of course, in Tanzania, and there was a nine-day international institute on um, training on nonviolent communication. And there were 85 of us, 15 different countries, and everyone that was there is, was affiliated or running an NGO. And I remember that one session during the nine days, um, the the woman who was facilitating asked us each, there were probably 15 of us in this session, to pick up a card. And on the card was the name of uh, a universal need. And so I picked up connection. And I remember uh, another friend of mine, um, uh, actually, no, I picked up community and another friend of mine picked up connection. And so she asked us just to stand there in this circle and to think about the last time this need was not met. And she gave us four or five minutes mm -hmm. in silence, thinking back to the time when that need was not met. Um, and then she offered an opportunity for anyone to share what they were thinking. And I remember my friend um, who I've known for 15 years, and I work with her uh, at Mount Gaza. Um, she had picked connection and, and she said, well, the last time I didn't have this met uh, was this past year when my mother passed away and she started crying. And there was a woman next to me who immediately um, started going over towards her to console her. And Gita, the, the, the German woman who was facilitating this, said, stop, go back. And it was very abrupt. But she was like, don't go over there. Go back to your place in the circle. And then Gita spoke to um, the woman who was experiencing um, that sort of grief. And, and she said, we are here for you. Take your time. And so what I realized is I realized two things that relate to nonviolent communication. Um, number one is that it was my instinct as well to go and console her. And empathy is not changing the feelings of another person. It's not trying to fix it. It's not trying to rationalize it. It's not trying to help them understand it in a different way. It's not offering them a book. It is empathy is rare but we know when we feel it because it is a person saying, I am here, I'm with you and I'm offering my presence to you. And so the second thing that really struck me is that I started to feel that same emotion of grief in my chest. And I started to, to tear up and many of us were because watching someone else experience an emotion like that reminds us of that emotion. And so how often do I want to fix or change the feelings of another person because it's myself that mm -hmm. doesn't want to feel it. So for me, nonviolent communication is about presence. It's about how much presence do I have with myself and my needs, knowing that everything I feel is pointing towards a need I have. How aware am I of the needs that I have? And can I speak what I'm needing to anyone? And then can I offer empathy to others and help them to recognize and identify what they're needing, but ultimately to offer presence. So whether it's, whether it's breathing um, or nonviolent communication or meditation or yoga, I see all of these as integrated uh, practices um, that start with myself. Um, what is my breath telling me? As I'm 
my heart is beating as she is crying. My heart is beating very fast. Where is my breath? Oh my God, my breath is really rapid right now. Why is that? Because I'm feeling that grief. And then how do I honor that and recognize the need I have and then show up in a way that offers empathy and connection to her? That, thank you for sharing that story. And, lit, and literally, I, I've had a similar, not so much experience, but it's like a bit of similar, um, almost just re-education of understanding that you don't have to go fix other people's problems. Mm -hmm. You just have to say, I see you and I hear yeah. you and I acknowledge it. Like that's been a really big re-education for myself as well. But I love that you pulled that all in together because I think really what, what that woman was doing, I mean, she was just doing what she knew and what we've been taught is that you take away pain. You make it That's as right. quick as possible, but pain is a feeling and a message and an indicator of some need not being met. And it doesn't mean right. that it has to be smoldered. It just has to be seen and acknowledged and released. So I, yeah. that was, that was awesome. And yeah, I, it's, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, I have a, a segue next. So you say- I was, the, the other thing I was gonna add about that is it it's challenged me. Um, and I realized that the desire to fix Mm. is really depriving the other person of their experience, of and, their the experience. Learning, and the opportunity to learn from it and it's disempowering because it's i'm communicating in one way or another i don't trust you to navigate this yeah or ena or enabling them to not be able to grow from it or that's right oh but actually but you know honestly yours is so much more powerful i don't trust you to navigate this experience yeah yeah, I, I trust myself to give you the answers and you need me and my answers. And, and as, a, as a white man, oh, we could spend a whole nother podcast episode unpacking that. Uh, oh, you uh, just, oh, oh, this is not a podcast. You just elevated my status. Uh, no, this is merely a conversation I'm recording and putting on my blog so that I can feel it. I can feel a need of having meaningful conversations. So I've, <laughs> I've got two, I've got two segues for this. Sure. One is, Talk about your Tonglin breathing because I want to make sure I give yeah. you credit for all the great work you're doing. That's another area. <laughs> just following you around Greenville. That's another area that I've gotten to know you that you lead these wonderful Tonglin breathing practices. And it was something I was unfamiliar with. And then the second part is we'll talk about the, the our energy being our contribution and how the shift in your energy has shifted the energy and those around you. So part one, Tonglin, tell me about that. And then we'll sure. look back to the, the energy as our contribution. Yeah, um, I came across Tonglin um, about three and a half years ago. Yeah. And I didn't know that it was called Tonglin. I didn't know that it existed. Yeah. I started, I started doing it in my own sort of breathing meditation practice. But, um, you know, as a man, I, I think a lot of people growing up would tell me, well, be a strong man. And no one ever tells a man how to be strong. Yeah. And so um, I was completely disconnected from my own feelings, from my own needs, from my own breath. Um, so about three and a half years ago, um, I was I was going through the end of a relationship and I was really grieving the end of this relationship. And so... I remember being at home and, and in the back room and I was meditating and I was just right in the middle of that grief. Yeah. And so there are a couple of things I had used to do. One is, oh, let me analyze this. Why, why is this feeling here now? And the more I would analyze it, the more I'm pushing it away. Um, or let me just stop the meditation. Let me go and eat something. Let me go and talk to a friend. Let me text someone. Let me do anything to distract myself. So the Tonglin breathing, um, I started just inhaling deeply and feeling that grief. And I remember telling myself, I want this grief close. And so there was a choice. There was a willingness on my part to say, you are welcome here. This grief, you are always welcome. Just as I embrace and hold joy close to me, I'm going to hold grief close to me. And on the inhale, I'm really feeling that grief in my body. And on the exhale, each exhale, I started sending myself reassurance and loving reminders that I was safe, that I was okay. 
And I remember like inhaling and feeling the grief and then sending not to another person, but to myself, that reminder, that reassurance. So, you know, then I, I think in the last two years, um, I started looking into that Zen Buddhist practice, which is taking in and sending is what it's called loosely translated. Yeah. And so we take in on the inhale and that's uncomfortable for people, you know, taking in a difficult feeling. Um, and then on the exhale, sending that loving energy. And so the group that I lead to, that practice that together, um, sometimes we, uh, well, not sometimes first we do that with ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I call it, um, remembering presence. So let me do that inhaling of a difficult feeling with myself and send it to myself. And we'll do that for 15 minutes or so. Yeah. And then we'll pause. And then I invite everyone to think of someone that they know, or even someone they don't know, that is experiencing something very difficult. And then we use that breathing meditation practice um, to inhale that difficult feeling and then to send them loving energy. And I think the last thing I'd say is that I value that practice because it has taught me to pull um, emotions close to me that I have historically typically pushed away. Yeah. Instead, no. we want to keep the positive, so to speak, the yeah. joy, the, the connection. We want to keep those close. We want to push away loneliness or grief or anxiety or any anything that's challenging. And so that practice is really taught me to switch it. And yeah. to do it in community with people is, is a beautiful thing. Oh. Well, the, the community, like, I feel like the energy alone, just by having like-minded supporting souls around you, like that alone can ail or can heal, can heal any ailment. And then, then too, I think just in general, you don't have to push away or hold close to anything. Just like, let it be, like, let, right. let it be, just see it, acknowledging it. Um, that's, that's really cool. And I, what I, what I love are like the things that we just start innately doing. Like, I love that you just started doing that. And then you found out, oh, there's actual practice for this. I, called something. Yeah, it's called something. It's, it's legit. I'm, I'm on the right path. Um, and then getting to that second question that I had, um, I did not share this in the intro, but Philip is a Reiki level three practitioner. So that's pretty cool as well. You definitely have a sense of your energy and others' energy. So I remember hearing this quote, my energy is my contribution. And that really resonated with me because I think so often it's seen as um, not right or wrong is too rudimentary, but it's seen as like inactivity or like you have to be very vocal about something or you have to like be very active, but truly that's not my nature. And so when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's, that's me. Yeah. Like, I want to be a presence. I want to be empathetic energy. I want to provide like that safe space. And that's how I contribute. And by me resignating and um, basically regulating my energy that then I see it kind of ripple out using the water metaphor to others so I wanted to ask you since god remind me how long ago did you move here from Illinois 2013 okay so, so since 2013 nine years. and since that first yoga class since you've gotten your yoga yogurt <laughs> yoga teacher certification started teaching Tonglin integrating nonviolent communication what are the ripple effects of the people around you that you've kind of noticed from your energy well, I think that um, I don't often think of that. Um, I, I just, I feel what it has done for me. And, um, you know, I think a lot in the last couple of months, the word that keeps coming back to me in my own practices is just presence. So if you think of like the most gentle person, you know, the person who just has that gentle, compassionate equanimity. Um, they have that with themselves. They, uh, they accept themselves more than anyone else. They laugh at themselves more than anyone else. 
they forgive themselves more than anyone else. <laughs> they understand that there's nothing to really blame or judge, but that life is just a process of understanding. Uh -huh. And it's a process of remembering essentially the essence of who you are, which is goodness. Yeah. So I think the presence that I can offer, that you can offer, and I've seen you offer others, um, is rooted in that presence with self. We cannot have that presence with others unless we have that presence with ourselves. We cannot have that presence with ourselves unless we are aware of and grateful for the sacredness of our breath. Mm -hmm. That every morning when I wake up, I have the same sort of reaction these days, which is, well, holy shit, I get to do this again. I have another day. And what is this going to day, day going to be? And who am I going to talk to today? What am I going to learn today? What am I going to experience today? Because life is so precious. Um, and the breath, the only thing that separates me from death is this breath. Oh, man. And I don't know when the next one will be here or if it will be here, but I celebrate the sacredness of it. So that presence that, that we can extend to others um, uh, is rooted in that presence with self and I am grateful for the abundance of friends that I have here in Tanzania elsewhere um, that that offer me that presence and I offer them that presence um, and those are my people right yeah. yeah well it's like you get to choose your family your family of community and those type things well I can tell yeah. you the things that as I lean in closer to the microphone, I can tell oh. you what I've, what I've seen is you're offering practices that truly benefit people, myself included, and you do it so willingly and openly that it's, it's really cool and fun to see. Um, I've also like talked to people that have been to your classes that have said like, I was like, like actively working on the things that you're teaching them outside of their mat, which is like the goal. <laughs> The yeah, goal, right? please. Everything we're doing on the mat is so that you can practice it off your mat. But yeah. so I, I set you up for what what do you think your ripple is? But I can tell you what your ripple is. It's it's palpable. It's you can feel it and you can feel it and just not having that anxiety in your chest, not having the tightness, like actually feeling your shoulders loosen, soften, your jaw relax, like all those things. It's it's just very much there and that doesn't happen overnight so that doesn't sound like I know you've done a lot of work to get there so thank you yeah, and it, it doesn't on. it doesn't happen overnight and I, there's no sort of arrival right no um as soon as I my ego starts to think oh I've got this handled I've got this mastered the universe is like oh really yeah oh let's let's give you more practice with yeah. that um but I think that all of the words that I have, all of the practices I have, the awareness I have um, is appropriated from those that I'm around. Yeah. And as a, you know, to delve into my, my professorship at Clemson a bit, like I studied language, I studied literacy. And a core belief of mine is that no word is owned by any person. Mm. That every meaning I have in my mind, every word that I know, I have appropriated, I have witnessed others using, and then I have made it into my own sort of meaning based on my experience which is the way that language works yeah. but it's the way that emotions work and energy work and practices like who we surround ourselves with is is essential um soil for what we're going to grow together and the presence i have is because of the presence you offer it's the presence that brian delaney offers it's the presence that that, that my good friends offer um, so I think that's what I've learned about the ripple effect is it always comes back to us. Mm -hmm. it does. I love that. No word is ever owned by anyone that includes words, emotions, and energy. That's awesome. Well, to kind of wrap us up, um, tell me something that you're working on, you're excited about that you want to share that, that you want people to know about this. This is your time just to like plug whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to Sure. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for the space to, to connect. And, and um, I think the thing that is challenging me now, not in a difficult way, 
but I see the opportunity is to really think about what does it mean for us to, uh, to learn about presence? And specifically, I'm thinking of men. I'm thinking of young men and men that are transitioning in terms of their level of uh, in which they're awake to themselves. Um, and so I am really excited about men that are learning to identify what they're feeling, to develop that emotional awareness. I'm excited about how we as men are able to identify what am I needing right now? What is the presence that I have with myself? What is my body telling me about the level of equanimity and, and peace that I have? And how am I communicating in nonviolent ways to myself? And then now let me look at how am I creating violence in relationships and in my life and in the context that I'm in. Um, so I think that any sort of like deep connection and relationship, deep levels of community, um, the level of liberation and freedom that we all experience, I think that's of course rooted in the level that we have that within ourselves. And so I'm, I'm really intrigued by what it looks like to support that education of self yeah. with everyone, but especially with men. And I, um, coming off of three months in Tanzania, where we're doing a lot of work around gender-based violence. Yeah. And there's a lot of trauma that has been being processed and, and experienced by women, by young girls. Um, that we have to focus on the way that we as men connect with ourselves. And we have to come back to the answering that question. What does it mean to be strong? What does it mean to be a strong man? And how can we support each other in offering a true, strong male presence so and what's I think that's the, okay so what's the answer and when is your book coming out <laughs> <laughs> i don't know the second part i'm working on that um, you are good yeah, yeah nice the, yeah the first part, well i'm i'm pot committed now that i've just admitted it right <laughs> you heard well, it first yeah. here of breath, um, breath but but the answer is i think everything that you and i have just shared yeah. You know, I, and I, I don't think it's a male answer or a female answer. Yeah. But my experience was that I was largely asleep for 40 years. Uh -huh. And that I caused a great deal of violence to myself internally. Um, that I had, I had significant depression and anxiety. I was in a marriage that just was, was really, really traumatizing for both of us. But I was seeding my happiness. I was giving away my peace because I was wanting others to tell me what do I have to do to be a strong man? What do I have to do to be peaceful? What do I have to do to love? Instead of really coming home to myself and saying, okay, how can I be responsible for the ripples? Um, and ultimately, how can I be responsible for the presence that I have in myself? Do I really have peace within myself? Or am I thrown off course by what one person says? Or am I thrown off course by this you know, manuscript that's rejected by a journal. How, how attached am I to other people telling me who I am? And so my answer is that it starts with our breath. What is my breath telling me? What are my emotions, which are the wisdom of spirit? What are my emotions trying to tell me? It's trying to lead me toward my needs being met. And if I meet my needs, if I get my needs met, then I'm going to be more peaceful. And I'm going to be living in a community of connection. That's my answer. Uh, I give it a 10 out of 10. That was excellent. Um, well, Philip, I'm so glad that you have awoken that you, oh, the mail just arrived. The mail just arrived. Um, no but, pun intended, huh? No, no, literally the mail, literally the mail, oh, the mail just arrived and Vanna's off to get it. Well, the very thought provoking thing I was going to say is I'm so glad you've awoken to yourself and you're navigating your waters. Thank you for sharing your gifts and your time. And I can't wait to have that other conversation um, at a future date. But thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. And, and I am so grateful for you, for you um, following your path and <laughs> of integrity and authenticity and doing the work that you are here to do, which is to connect people to their breath. So you cultivate this space and I'm, I'm really thankful for you. Oh, thanks, Philip. All right, with that.
talk soon. Sounds good. Okay. Bye.